Now, how do you introduce the topic of sexual addiction <laughs> before your congregation or before a large group? How do you do that as a leader? We want to make sure for those of you who have signs and marquees that it's addressed in an appropriate way. Every ministry context is different, but we want to make sure it's not like the church who put up the sign, don't let stress kill you, let the church help. <laughs> so we have to be careful with signs. We have to be careful with bulletins and programs and teaching notes. I know our church recently did a series called Love Song. And it was a verse-by-verse -verse approach. Our church uses a topical approach to teaching. It uses a verse-by-verse -verse approach, textual topical. There's all sorts of styles. Just like there are different styles of music, there are different styles of teaching. Truth is the key. And we did a verse-by-verse -verse approach through all 12 chapters of the Song of Solomon. Right. And we called it Love Song. It wasn't as rough, but I'll tell you, there were a lot of senior adults in our church who struggled with knowing that we were going to be spending eight weeks talking about romance, intimacy, and sex. Mm -hmm. So I had many of them come to me and say, hey, we love this church. We love what's going on. We're not comfortable with the topic that you're about ready to go into. Uh, we're going to be gone for the next eight weeks. Well, mm -hmm. you'll remember, Gary, mm -hmm. well, you weren't one of them, were you? No, but, I hope but not. my oh, wife my was. <laughs> yeah, Norma was nervous, and she'd call me, though, on Saturdays and kind of just give me a little pep talk before the, the next morning. Something happened in the communication of our church where a lot of them got confused. A lot of our That's seniors right. got confused. We about, get confused anyway. Yeah. <laughs> about when it started. And so a lot of them showed up for the start of that series. Uh -huh. And afterwards, they came to us and said, oh, this is great. Yeah. And so they, they, they were nervous. So people are going to be nervous as you get this started. What we're saying is you don't necessarily have to put a real in-your-face sign or mm -hmm. bulletin out there to right. really try right. to draw people exactly. and, I, and I know there are churches that are using billboards right. and 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 advertising to bring people in but you may be a chaplain in a hospital or you may be in the military or a youth pastor I mean any number of opportunities this can be used at with the group that they're speaking to so what we did is we were teaching the love song series we had big signs made and the signs uh, every week would change depending on the topic we were addressing. The first couple weeks were great, and actually the first several chapters of the Song of Solomon address mm -hmm. singles anyway, so we included everybody, and we would label that service PG or PG-13. There were several weeks, though, where we knew the topic was going to get a little stronger, where we advertised it, and when you came in three places when you walked into our church, you walked through a facility that's geared towards kids before you get to the main auditorium, and we'd have these big signs made, and the, it said, due to the content of today's message, this service is rated PG-17. Right. What was great about that is it allowed parents to be able to make the decision for themselves. Mm -hmm. And what we would do on those PG-17 Sundays is we asked our youth leaders to go over to an, another facility and do an entire sexual purity to do an entire, and they actually took the exact same text we were using in the Song of Solomon, but addressed it in a little bit different area. They used sexual addiction materials to, to help young people in a different way. But I was amazed at the number of parents who came up to us at the mm -hmm. end of a service and said, ah, oh, I wish our teenagers would have been in here with us. I wish our kids would have been in here to hear this. And so they've gone back online to get that. It was uh, raw material from scripture, but I never felt inappropriate. I mean, you can share the truth in a way that's not inappropriate and can be shared in a congregation or in a Bible study or or a small group, whatever context. And as we led into it, we used words such as masturbation, mm -hmm. orgasm, breast. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used heavy words in those PG-17, but right. it was done in an appropriate, tasteful way. Exactly. And, and while it shocked people, mm -hmm. uh, we were addressing real heart mm -hmm. issues. And so one in of fact, the you're keys, including your sermon series in this particular series. Yeah, you can right get the teaching notes and the transcripts because what we want to help people do is to, to walk in one Sunday and to pick up teaching notes or to see on the screens or to just hear an announcement that today we're starting a talk on sexual addiction. Right. It's kind of like not informing your leaders yes. before you, <laughs> you change the direction of the church right. or you introduce this into small groups. Right. Giving people time to get ready for this, right. giving people time to talk about this. But you don't have to have a series called How to Overcome Sexual Addiction. 
you can share. I think Freedom Begins Here is a phenomenal study Mm -hmm. that would cover a lot of addictions, but people walk into a Freedom Begins Here series, and and there's going to be teaching notes provided, and Dr. Laser's provided a lot of stuff that people can go through, and that title on a sign isn't going to be offensive. Freedom Begins Here, the whole concept of freedom is given to us by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, the living, powerful, two-edged sword Word of God. This is why Christ died, to give us freedom, so that you can develop that message in any number of ways and be very appropriate because it's all about freedom. And Gary and I both are pretty open and honest in our stories and sharing with people what's going on in our lives and sharing the Scripture from a what I call a no-nonsense, at times in-your-face approach right, right. to But to he scripture. adds humor and throughout the entire series, and that's such a key. I have found as a, as a speaker uh, speaking various countries of the world, whenever I start and include humor all the way through, it relaxes the audience. We can laugh at some of the most serious things, right. and it just seems to... Uh, break through those barriers. Right. Let's give them a couple of practical uh, series that they could start with. Uh, There's the obvious ones that come to mind quickly, like the story of David and Bathsheba. A a lot of people would would hear that and go, okay, well, that's going to come to us out of, uh, you know, Scripture, straight from Scripture. And maybe it's in a series where you're going through 1st and 2nd Samuel, and you're going to walk through that, and you're going to get that story. And that's a Sunday where you can introduce, maybe you take two Sundays to share the story, and, or maybe you take three Sundays because the story of David and Bathsheba carries a lot of great uh, defining truths for us as believers that you take a few weeks to cover that one story, and in that, you cover all areas of sexual addiction or as many as you can get through. Or maybe, there's another key, you just introduce sexual in, addiction into the message and say, this week, it's going to be on our blog. It's going to be, I'm going to send out an email. It's in our newsletter. Small groups have been established for the purpose. I've ha- asked a couple of Sunday school classes to actually take this material so that you can come in and it's not going to be above the door. Please, churches that love signs, be careful not to put, this is the sexual addiction Sunday school class. Right. I mean, that's right. kind of like, right. yeah, very few people are going to walk through. Right. You could even do it as low key as Psalm 1 uh, and some key word there. But when you have David and Bathsheba and you use Psalm 1, he wrote it, you know that in his heart, David's heart had to have been a belief. Well, he was a warrior. He was excited about life. He, you know, he was stimulated by life. Obviously, he had a belief in his heart that involved uh, pleasure mm. and thrills. And, 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 in, and in Psalm uh, uh, 39, where he says, God, know my heart. I don't want anything in it that disappoints you. Mm. I don't want anything of the world in my heart. I want only in my heart you and your word and your mm. commands. Love you and love others. So when I, when I think of uh, David and Bathsheba, I think of Psalm 1 where, where David says, Bless am I, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the path of, of, of the wicked, the people are already convicted. You know, we know right. that they're wicked. He, he doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of mockers. Listen how exciting this is. But he delights, he craves, he gets excited about the law of God. And he meditates on it day and night. Now, when I used to read this when I was younger, and even as, as a pastor, I used to go, uh oh, uh, meditate on the law of God. I mean, that'd be impossible. Who in the world can meditate on the law? I thought of all those little laws and precepts and all those things in Scripture. I thought, I don't even know what half those things mean. Mm. I can't do what David did. Hey, the bottom line is, Jesus said the law is summarized in loving our King God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving others as we would like to be loved. Mm. I mean, that's pretty simple. I meditate on that, I chew on that day and night, and then I become, you could become, the people in your church can become, Mm. the people in your small group, in the military, in the hospitals, wherever you're working, they can become like a tree planted by streams of water. I can just see myself planted right by a beautiful brook, 
and my roots are going deep into God's love and, and the nourishment from the nutrients in the soil and the water flowing in my roots and up to my leaves and my leaves are green all the time and the fruit in my life is ripe mm. and all that I do prospers. That applies to sexual addiction, that applies to anything you're addicted to because by far the majority of addicted, to, sexually addicted people are male but women have their whole areas of addiction with shopping and and, uh, and all the things that you're addicted to as may be different from us as males, but nevertheless, we're addicted. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, there's so many sections of scripture that apply yeah. that you can just make. I, I, I'm in the middle of a new book and, and our blessed uh, apostle John, uh, captured slave on an island, writes the three biggies, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes mm -hmm. and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, right at the heart of sexual addiction. So there's so many ways you can preach on this and teach on this and, and speak on it. A, a series on the Ten Commandments oh. uh, would be... <laughs> a, se a series on the Ten Commandments is another series that could introduce oh, the topic God, of sexual yeah, addiction. Exactly. You could do a series uh, out of Nehemiah. Oh, let's go back to the Ten Commandments. Okay. <laughs> we'll do the series on Nehemiah in just a second. <laughs> the Ten Commandments. Listen to this one. When you realize that the third commandment, don't take the Lord God's name in vain. When I got into that, I realized that vanity, vain, is a lie. We're trying to be something that we're not. So when you make God into something he's not, you're taking his name in vain. So it's not just swearing. Obviously, that's vanity because he's not, he's not uh, uh, proposing it and it's not true of him, what you're saying about him in, 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 a, in, in a swearing way. But what about freedom, sexual addiction? What about freedom in every area of life? He says, we have been given freedom. Don't use our freedom for sinful pleasures, but for loving others and by serving them. We are calling him a liar if we look at that section of Scripture and say, well, that's not true. That's not going to happen to me. Or <laughs> let's give God thanks in all circumstances. There's a verse. Let's thank him for everything. Well, first of all, I'm not going to thank him for everything. That's taking his name in vain. He's not a liar. When he says thank him, he means thank him and give him thanks. Oh, You know what I love about this? What? I grew up knowing Gary Smalley as the marriage expert, yeah, yeah. and I think a lot of people probably did as well, and now yeah. they're seeing, wow, he was a pastor and <laughs> still is a preacher. That's that's good. Good. <laughs> I'm into that's the, good. oh, I've been hiding the Ten Commandments in my heart. That's good. Oh, and I love it. So I work on them every day. So that's a series. I'm going to share with them about <laughs> Nehemiah. Oh, yeah. and, and the, the story of when the wall is being built, I love this imagery. I use it in a lot of leadership teaching to where we've got a job to do in building the church. We have a job to do in growing the kingdom of God. And that takes work and it takes us directing our attention and applying ourselves to the wall. Right. But the imagery you get is that they're building the wall with one hand uh -huh. while being guarded with the sword uh, yeah, in the other. Yeah. I mean, what a great area yeah. to introduce the topic and to begin teaching on it. What I love, so many times as, as pastors, I know I fall into the trap of thinking about this week it's taken a staff and a creative team around me to help me think six months down the road mm -hmm. that I don't have to, I, the number of times I hear pastors just touch on sexual addiction and tell people, get help, and then their church sits back and goes, yeah, or they'll go forward and they'll come clean and they'll be convicted and, mm -hmm. and they'll want their life to mm -hmm. change and they'll desire that change, and then the church is kind of, and I've been there, mm -hmm. and we're there oftentimes that we go, well, we have this program over here, we send them to it, but, but to really dive into it, to give five, six, seven areas, different resources that they can go right. to to get help, yeah. to give them an assessment tool. Right. I'm going to use the 25 questions from the sexual addiction screening test. I'm going to put it all on the screen one Sunday right. and go through, and I'm not going to say stand up if you answered mm -hmm. six or more of these, but there can be a little connection card or you a comment You can make a joke card. of it and ask them to, okay, let's have all those. <laughs> no, we were oh, rushing not to do that. But but the, the number of creative ways, there's the judge's sin cycle. There's the every man did right in his own eyes, did whatever he wanted to do. We've got that material where 
providing for you. So many creative ways to introduce this into the, and the other thing large that, group that setting. you do that I love, and you could do this, is invite an expert with you while you speak, and the two of you sit on these types of chairs or behind a table mm. on the platform. It's such a dynamic thing for the audience to hear back and forth bantering and and uh, and the, some of the ones you invite in, you actually can laugh together, and you know uh, some mild sarcasm, you know, with each yeah. other. And it's just so much fun as the audience to see the real thing talked about, with one of them being a, an expert, maybe in the area of sexual addiction, but then the pastor or or the leader, the expert in God's word. So you put them to you put them together. It's just it's wonderful. You know, when Paul progressed in his spiritual life, I loved how, how his progression worked out. And it's kind of the opposite today in our, in our churches and in Christianity. He started off by saying, I am the least of the apostles. Mm. Okay, so here's a list. He says, I'm going to put myself at the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. Then he said, I am the least of the saints. So he, he was getting a more sane estimate of who he is. By the mm -hmm. end of his ministry, he said, I am the chief of sinners. Mm. Ah! And I've tried to use that as a model in my own ministry and encourage you to do the same thing, to let the people in your church know or anyone that you're leading know that, hey, I'm a man. I struggle with this. I want you to know your pastor, your leader is not above this. Mm. I, and that's why we put caution, you know, precautions in place. Mm -hmm. I have a list of 10 things that I've given to all of our staff of mm -hmm. areas that we need to be careful. I don't counsel people you know, with the door closed. Mm -hmm. I don't go to lunch uh, you know, with, with women alone. I, I change that policy and said, and I don't visit in homes unless they're over the age of 70, which has offended a lot of the seniors <laughs> in our... But they get that. They, they go, ah, oh, we get that. that you're And, and I've had walked into some ladies' home, well, we know you're not you know, going to try anything. You know, yeah, they get all, a, all nervous. But exactly. I put all that in yeah. place. And you know what's more important than just saying, this is my standard? I have mm. shared that. Right. I don't get asked out to dinner mm -hmm. by a lady right. or out to lunch because they know Ted's yeah. communicated yeah. this. When you start to communicate your right. accountability through yeah. message series, right. and if you're an expository preacher or you're a topical teacher, it doesn't matter. Right. Whatever you're teaching on, work into your annual planning. Almost every pastor I know, every speaker, yeah. teacher, pastor I know today is doing some sort of planning. Mm -hmm. And we're not just putting together, you know, a quick message on Saturday night to deliver on Sunday. We're planning it out through the year. You and, and so plan a time. I address sexual addiction at least once a year, but it's usually more than that. Mm -hmm. And it's in the schedule. I don't do it in June because I know June's kind of a downtime mm -hmm. for churches. People take a lot of vacations. It's a fall or a spring topic for me where I know I have a lot of people mm -hmm. and a lot of life change that can take place. Well, let me just say something about him that's very important. Uh, when you're teaching whatever position you have, uh, Sunday school teacher, whatever, whatever you find yourself, it's so important, and you reminded me of this just a minute ago, to humble yourself. When in Philippians chapter 2, when Jesus, Paul said that Jesus humbled himself and then went on the cross, that's obviously humiliating, but part of the Greek word humble is to low list yourself. If you're with five people, you're number five. If you're with 10, you're number 10. So when Paul kept saying he was lower and lower and lower, he was actually humbling himself. God says, I only give my powerful living grace to the humble. And as I've watched him humble himself before this body, it's growing like a weed, your congregation, our congregation. And so, but I've noticed that they so identify with him because he is admitting that he's human, struggling, and, and working on the same solutions he wants the congregation to work on. And so as we humble ourselves, not only does God lift us up, give us power, but people do yeah. around us. And so that's so important to keep that mindset that it's okay to admit that you're struggling in certain areas of life. You're struggling with them. You ask them to pray for you. That's exactly what right. I've seen him do. Now, here's another really important point. He was pastoring in a church, and it was, it was growing, uh, uh, maintaining, and uh, there was some conflict that, that arose, and the conflict actually humbled you. And you felt at some point as like a leave. failure. Yeah. You wanted to leave right. as a failure. What I got the privilege of doing, because I got kind of excited when he was going down in, in, yeah. in confidence and attitude and so on, because I know that when we get humbled by life, 
you can't have anything better. You can't buy this in seminary. You can't just go out and buy it at the you know, local store. Life allows us to go through some real struggles at times when we feel like a failure. Those are the times that God really delights because he says, I bless those that are poor in spirit. And sometimes life puts us there. And then all of a sudden we realize I'm where God wants me. I remember when I felt so defeated when I was like 40 years old. I felt like such a failure. And then it dawned on me, this is where God wants me. Yeah. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm, I'm dead. I'm just, I'm, I, I, I feel like a failure. And I said, God, thank you that I'm here. You do the lifting up. You do the in, infusion of your spirit, your grace into my life. And I watched him lift me up mm. and bring me back to a whole new level of ministry. My entire marriage ministry came out of a total disastrous failure. Mm. Another practical way that you can implement a sexual addiction program into the church and in before the the whole congregation or group that you lead i never introduce a resource to the church that i haven't gone through myself for obvious reasons most of it's theological do i agree with what's being said do i agree with the speaker or the text and here's what i've found if you say hey in our resource center on the way out we have freedom begins here it's on sexual addiction stop by and get a copy if you're struggling with it well, I mean, there's like a lot of steps between that resource center and the parking lot, and people won't be as familiar. What I do is I have it on the stage, on the platform with me. I show it. I tell them, I've gone through it, and here's what I want you to do. This is so key to helping people work through these issues. I say, listen, you may not be struggling with it. You may not have a problem with sexual addiction, but you have a grandson, a son, or someone who does, when I start to introduce all the ways that this resource can be used into the congregation from the front, now when they see a 40 or 50 year old lady walking out to her car holding the featured resource of the Sunday, uh, now nobody's going, oh my, he must have a problem. <laughs> we, let me give you an, an example that kind of parallels that. We, we do a food pantry at our church. We have a food pantry that we give to the poor. Well, what we've started to do is we want people to, we don't want to be one of these that, you know, it's so hard, you got to jump through so many hoops to get groceries. Well, what we've done to restore dignity to the process is you can pick up groceries from our church if you have a need on Sunday morning. But what we didn't want to have happen is everybody that was walking through the parking lot holding bags of groceries going, oh, that person must mm -hmm. have fallen on hard times and all that. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've told the church, if you have someone in your neighborhood, and we talk about this a lot, if you have someone in your neighborhood who's struggling and has a need, take a bag of groceries for them. So now when they're walking out the door with it, we don't know exactly. the story at all. And you're, and, and to be honest with you, I get pretty frustrated with caring about you know, why somebody's caring. I, I think we get pretty hypocritical and, and we don't need to be judgmental, Matthew 7, and we need to focus on ourselves and not be worried about what everybody else is doing. But since you probably have humans in your church like I have humans <laughs> in my church, mm -hmm. that's one way to kind of disarm people. Give, give it, you know, that you know when four or five resources are being picked up. Like we've done campaigns, which I would encourage you to do. Do an entire campaign on sexual addiction. Don't call it the sexual addiction campaign for the next eight weeks. Nobody will show up or they will be, ah, not wanting to stay there for too long. Instead, have them come to a Freedom Begins Here campaign, and maybe your church, because I know our church will, gives that resource out. instead of, and, and then that way, I'm not buying it. That way, we did this with, and many of you probably went through uh, 40 Days of Purpose or 40 Days of Community Purpose Driven Life. Our church gave out so many resources with that. Giving resources out or giving multiple opportunities mm -hmm for that resource being distributed is going to make the person who probably needs it the most be a little bit more okay with getting it and not worried about what this person or that person because is thinking Because everybody's on the way carrying out. it out to their car. Everyone's yeah. carrying it, yeah. yeah. So what we hope this segment has done has encouraged you to introduce it. Don't be afraid. This isn't going to be something. I, if you're in a church that would fire you over introducing it, I'm actually maybe going to be strong enough to say, that's okay. There's a lot of churches that need great leaders today. And I just told people to go ahead and be fired. But anyway, mm -hmm. the, you get the point. I do. <laughs> <laughs> we just want this time to be a time for you to just begin to introduce it to your group.